Good evening. Well, it's evening here, you're on. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Afternoon here. So I need to tell you a little story to get this interview going. Um, I accidentally started podcasting about two and a half years ago. I discovered this thing called Bitcoin. I didn't understand it. I'm not very political. I don't really understand economics. I'm certainly not technical. So I started this podcast to to kind of go through a journey of learning about Bitcoin. And and here I am two and a half years later, and uh, I've had quite a few people follow the show. And what happens is I get a lot of emails every week, people telling me different things that I should be following and who's talking nonsense. And I got this email last week from a chap called Adam, and he said, Hi, I, I continue to enjoy your podcast, but sometimes I lose patience with your apparent conflation of libertarianism and anarchism. And it uh, goes on to make a few points. And I was like, okay, help me out here. Who should I talk to? And he said, I really need to talk to you. So to give you the v- very short background is that um, I had no idea what libertarianism is before I discovered Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. I've spoken to a lot of libertarians. I like a lot of what they have to say. I didn't vote in the last UK election. But I've struggled to ever fully imagine a society without some form of government. And I've kind of got myself to this position where I directionally want less government, but a world of no government still scares the crap out of me. So I'm coming to you today, you're on with with no agenda, no questions. I just want to talk. I want to hear what you have to say. And hopefully I'm going to be able to navigate some of this and get a clearer picture from yourself because I've watched some of your videos and I sure. agree with a lot you have to say. Can you understand where I'm lost? Yeah, absolutely. Well, let, let me start by saying I, I completely sympathize with you. And you, your gut instinct, if you will, is absolutely right. That is, a world with no government would be a horror. Uh, equivalent to the horrors of the most oppressive statist regimes. So I am not an anarchist. Mm-hmm. Uh, and any of your listeners, I think, are going to be upset by the fact yeah. that I'm not an anarchist because so many Bitcoin, unfortunately, uh, supporters or, or people interested in Bitcoin are anarchists. No, I mean, I, I think that government is necessary, a necessary good, not a necessary evil. I think it, if it's limited to its proper function, and we can get into what the proper function is and why one should limit it, then it is a necessary good, and uh, the negation of it leads to what anarchy always leads to, which is bloodshed, uh, gang warfare, uh, and, uh, and, and you know, all hell breaks loose. And so I, I completely understand why you want some government, because there is one aspect of human life which you cannot leave to the market, because... This aspect of human life is what is necessary. If you exclude it, that's when markets get created. So it is it is a necessary, not sufficient, but a necessary feature of markets to get created. And that feature is violence, force. You have to exclude violence and force so that they becomes a marketplace. Right? If, if I can pull out a gun at any point in time and take your wallet, we're not going to trade. There's no point in trade. We're going to be watching each other's guns and we're going to be cautious of one another. Trust breaks down, contracts break down, everything breaks down. So the one thing, the one reason we institute governments is to exclude force from human interaction, exclude coercion, exclude, exclude uh, authority. And, 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 uh, and so that's the job of the government. The job of the government is to be a policeman. Uh, and, and a judiciary so we can arbitrate disputes because even, because we don't want to go out and duel in the streets when we disagree. And, you know, and provide a military to protect us from other people who would like, but that's, that's pretty much it. But it has to do that. If it doesn't do that, everything breaks down. See, I, I agree with all of this. And I found myself in a position sometimes where I've tried to argue for this. I get called a status slave or a status or a status cuck, all range of insults. Because to agree with any form of state or any form of government, the counter argument is, well, you, you still believe in coercion because some form of go- government is coercion. And I, and I understand the point they're making, but I can only foresee a, a Mad Max world without any form of government. And one of the things I've always said is like, okay, 
Well, what I would like to see is, is, and I, this came from a guy called Eric Voorhees, who, who said to me, let's not try and have the magic red button and switch off the state. Let's directionally move to less state. And I've always felt like, well, shouldn't we, should we try and wean ourselves off the state? See which bits we can get rid of and makes a better world and, and see which bits we actually know, we actually need that. And this whole defund the police, having no police, and not that I like the police, and certainly the problems in the US are very different from the UK, but I imagine no police and just think chaos. Yes. And see, so I don't take the approach of let's defund things slowly, progressively, see what works and what doesn't. I look at this from a principled perspective. Okay. And and part of the problem, I think, with libertarians, and, and I don't consider myself a libertarian, and maybe Adam should have... Uh, should have been clearer on on um, on the differentiation between all these different ideas and all these different groups. There's too many now. I have something called an objectivist, which okay. is uh, you know, and Ayn Rand. Uh, I, I believe Ayn Rand's uh, philosophy is true, and and uh, and the, part of the challenge with with uh, libertarians is they start with this idea: coercion is bad, and you ask them why is coercion bad? You know, most. Most ethicists, most philosophers in human history do not think coercion is bad. Uh, indeed, if you have to coerce something, somebody in order to achieve a good, then so be it. You know, and that's why we have taxes. That's why we have a welfare state. That's why we have all these government interventions is because a significant majority of humanity believes that coercion for the right cause is a good thing. So, I start with you need a philosophical explanation for why coercion is bad. And only then can we discuss, okay, is having any government coercion? I don't think it is because I think a government, a, a, a limited government that prevents coercion from happening is acting primarily in self-defense and an action in self-defense is not coercive, right? Mm -hmm. So if I'm preventing you from killing your neighbor, that's not coercion. Right, you were going to commit coercion, and I'm preventing that from happening by interfering. Or if you've already killed your neighbor, and I go and catch you and put you in jail, that is, in a sense, an act of self-defense. It is not an act of initiation of force. I'm protecting. I'm not initiating, and that's that's a crucial differentiation that comes out of why we even abhor coercion to begin with. Right. But I would say the element they say would be coercion is that tax isn't optional. And if I don't pay tax, I can end up in court and I can uh, end up being convicted as a, a criminal for tax evasion. That part would be considered coercion. Yes. And I think they're right. And this is why I'm against coercive taxation. Okay. So it is where, you know, again, I, 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 you know, you might view me as radical as they are. And, and Europeans have a hard time with this. But I think of taxes or, or the revenue from the government, I think that's just a problem to be solved. How does the government generate revenue without coercion? And I'd say there, there, there are two ways of doing this. One is there are certain services that the government can't charge for. For example, it, let's say the two of us have a contract. And we don't just want mediation and arbitration. But we actually want, if we truly disagree, this to be able to go to the state courts to be enforced by the police. Then when we sign the contract, we pay a certain fee to the courts to guarantee that contract. Okay. And we pay it in advance. And that funds the court system and, and certain aspects of government. So you could think of certain government services that you could charge a fee from. Now, you can't charge for the police because the police job is to protect us from violation of individual rights and you, you, they can't go around charging money uh, as that happens. But you can do it for, for a certain segment of what the government does. Patents, copyrights, the register, they would charge and they could fund part of the government. The second way the government would be funded in my world would be through voluntary contributions. Today, people write checks for all kinds of causes and many of them very large checks. Uh, and uh, Imagine a world in which we really have we have reached a point where people understand that we need to have a limited government and that government is going to protect them. And that's all it's going to do. It's not going to interfere in their lives. It's not going to tell them who to sleep with. It's not going to tell them who to marry. It's not going to tell them who to do business with and how much to pay their employees. It's just going to protect them. 
I think people would be happy to write a check to the government every, every I mean, indeed, my fear is the government would have too much money, not too little. And, and I would want some kind of provisioning of how that money gets returned back to the people who wrote the checks. But, uh, so you make it voluntary. You make, you make, and, and so, you know, people would come and say, well, that you create free rider problems, right? People who don't pay and still benefit from the fact. Sure. Who cares? Right. Free rider problems are everywhere. We have lots of free rider problems. I don't really care that we have free riders. As long as my rights are being protected, as long as I have a good police and a good military and a good judiciary, if a few people don't pay their taxes, uh, you know, so what? And, you know, there are all kinds of other mechanisms we can take care of that. You can have social, uh, you know, pressure. Uh, the government could, could actually publicize who pay taxes. And that's probably a good idea because you don't want people buying influence. So why not have a list of everybody who's paid into the system and we can all monitor that list and evaluate it. And if somebody, if my neighbor hasn't paid, you know, maybe I don't deal with that neighbor. Maybe I don't speak to him for, to, for a month or whatever uh, to kind of put social pressure on them. But yes, I agree with those libertarians who claim that coercion is evil. I agree, coercion is evil. And therefore the government needs to find ways to fund itself that are not coercive. Okay, so... I, I understand these kind of principles, and there are some. There is some alignment here with the libertarians, certainly. So, what areas sure. are, would you say the government's responsible for in the in the judiciary? Uh, contract law is obviously very important. Certain things, that I'm assuming, fraud, violent crimes. But I'm imagining very similar to libertarians. It's a, the the list of the list of possible crimes is a lot smaller. A lot smaller. A lot smaller. So, you know, all the financial crimes we have today have nothing to do with fraud. They could be left a voluntary association. So, for example, uh, you know, insider trading, right? Why can't that be a contractual issue between insiders in the company and shareholders or a contractual issue between the company and the exchanges in which they are listed and traded, right? So that's, uh, that's the kind of laws that just wouldn't exist. If, if, if shareholders didn't like companies that allowed insider trading, they wouldn't buy their shares. Uh, so a lot of the laws that, that protect consumers, not from fraud, but, uh, ex post, right? Uh, you would have a lot more reliance on civil law on things like liability and, and, and things like that. So, uh, there'd be no preventive law, right? No mm -hmm. law that says, you're not allowed to use this because there's certain possibility maybe. There'd be no regulatory agency that uh, allowed certain drugs, you know, certain vaccines, let's say, uh, to be used or not to be used. That would be, uh, I, I think what would happen is you'd have private entities that would screen medication, give recommendations to doctors. This gets a thumbs up. This gets a thumbs down. Use this. Don't use that. And doctors and patients would have to decide what kind of drugs and how much risk are they willing to take. I mean, a good example right now is these COVID vaccines. Why can't I go and get a vaccine right now? I mean, they've gone through phase one and phase two. In other words, they're fairly safe. And if I want to take the risk as an individual, why can't I go and get a vaccine? Why is the government dictating? And if there's a doctor who's willing to write me a prescription because he thinks they're pretty safe and the drug company is willing to sell them, even though they might face liability, why is the government deciding 30,000 people is the right number for phase three trial? And I have to be excluded. All of those kind of decisions would be given back to individuals and back to markets and back to voluntary relationships that we have with one another. All right. I'm, I'm going to run through a few scenarios with you. And sadly, you're probably, you're probably going to have covered this a few times with various people before, but I, I just think a specific scenario. So firstly, you haven't, you, I'm guessing you just have no objection to the forming of monopolies. Well, how do you define monopoly, right? So if you, if you, if you look at the word monopoly, mm -hmm. it comes from a government grant. So the, I think the East Indies company in, in, in Britain was the first monopoly. And the, the king basically gave them a grant to do all the trade between India and, and the UK. And they had a monopoly over it protected by the government. In a free market, the government doesn't have the power to do that. So there are no monopolies almost by definition because the government even granted that. If you're asking, do I have a problem with a company having large market share? The answer is absolutely not. Indeed, uh, you know, the goal of every successful company is to have large market share. That's, that means they've been successful. 
And to the extent that they continue to be successful and can sustain a large market share, it means they're doing the right thing. And if we take historical examples, for example, uh, Rockefeller, uh, Standard Oil in the 1870s, I think it was, had uh, 93% of all the oil refining capacity in the United States. Now, when we take classes in economics, and I don't know if you've taken an Econ 101 class, but we're taught that what happens, what happens then is prices are going to go up because there's no competition and quality will come down. But the fact is that's not what happens in reality. That is when somebody gets large market share, what usually happens is they keep prices down because they want to keep their market share. And they know that if they raise prices, there are no, I mean, there are no real barriers to entry. Uh, capitalism, the beauty of capitalism, is people are always trying to knock you down. And indeed, by the time Standard Oil was broken up in the 20s, in the 1920s, its market share was, was something like 23, 24%, not 93. And when it had 93% of the oil refining capacity, the product it was selling was a product called kerosene. You know what it was used for? Heating? No, it was actually used for light. Light. And who, who competed them out of existence? It was a lighting company. With Thomas the, Edison. Yeah, Edison, the bulb. Yeah, so who would have imagined? Imagine the bureaucrat sitting in 1873 thinking, oh, this is an uncompetitive business because they control 93% of the lighting business. Oh, wait, Edison is going to invent the light bulb soon. That would have never happened. So you'd have broken up Standard Oil because of lighting monopoly, but it was irrelevant by then because Thomas Edison was already working on a light bulb. So nobody can predict what the real competition is for any particular product and at any particular point in time. Today, our large so-called monopolies offer their, pr offer their product for basically zero, right? Google, what do you pay to use Google, right? Nothing. Nothing. What do we pay to use Amazon? Lower prices than what we pay. And, and of course, they don't even have a large market share. What do we pay any of these companies, Facebook or whatever? Zero. So uh, the whole framework of antitrust and the whole idea of monopolies, I think, comes from bad economics, bad political philosophy, really comes from bad thinking. It just, it's just not an issue. It never has been an issue. Uh, in a free market, never will be an issue. The, the real issue is when government gives you special favors, when government protects you from competition, then you have real barriers to entry that cannot be overcome. That's fair. Okay. Let me try another scenario with you. I watched a film recently called Dark Waters. It's about DuPont and when they were poisoning the water in a certain area, affected the cows or the cows died, and then a lot of people locally got sick. I'm, in this kind of scenario, where does that fit in terms of, say, is that a, is that a criminal law? Are there, are there regulations around, say, certain chemical usages and and... Like that feels like a complicated one. Sure, but not not that complicated. Okay. Not again. What what's the principle? The principle should be property rights, and the principle is that I can't harm you. And sometimes I harm you on purpose, and that's criminal. And sometimes I harm you by accident, and that's civil liability and the, the variety of liabilities. I don't know whether Dupont purposefully poisoned the water because it didn't care or it wanted to hurt cows and people. I, you know, let's assume, I, I don't know. But to an extent that they did it on purpose, let's say. And they knew that this was actually going to kill three people or they're going to kill X percent of the population or the people drinking the water, then it's criminal. They, they, they did something with the, with the full knowledge that somebody was going to die and they were the, were the absolute cause of that death. If on the other hand, which is more likely, they... You know, they just spewed their stuff into the river because it was an easy thing to do and they didn't really think about it and they didn't have evidence that this was going to kill anybody. They thought it was harmless or whatever. Then, and somebody got sick, then you would have to go to court and show that they were negligent or grossly negligent and you would, you would get compensation like you would in several law. But there is a third element here which I think solves a lot of these problems, which we don't have today at our detriment. Because we assume that they're throwing their chemicals into the water and then nobody owns this water. That is, this water is public property. Therefore, public property means nobody owns it. 
which means nobody takes care of it, which means nobody even, nobody can sue at that point. Nobody can tell you, you can't do that. Now, we know, for example, from British common law, hundreds of years going backwards, that you can't take your garbage and dump it in my backyard. Mm -hmm. That's settled law. We know that, right? Well, if I own the lake, or if I own that piece of the river, and there's no reason I can't own pieces of river or lakes, then you're not going to throw your trash in my river. DuPont is not going to dump their garbage in my river. And if they dump the garbage upstream and I own the river downstream, again, there's well-settled law on how to deal with polluters up here when I bear the consequences down here. And there are all kinds of ways in which we can deal with that from a contractual relationship and that the law steps in because you're damaging my property. So the solution to most pollution problems, I'm not going to argue all of them, but most pollution problems is private property. If you make the rivers private, and I know that sounds bizarre, but why not? If you make the lakes private, if you even start thinking about how to make the oceans, or at least the asset within the ocean, for example, fish, in Iceland, they have come up with a whole structure, legal structure, where they have basically privatized the fishing stock. And because it's private, the, you know, the, the fishermen don't have an interest in depleting it because they, in a sense, own it. And therefore, they have an incentive to, to keep it thriving, to keep it going. Uh, the same, by the way, happened in Africa. The way they dealt, uh, I think it was in Uganda or Kenya, the way they dealt with the extinction of elephants is they privatized the elephants. Now, if you privatize the elephant and you sell hunting licenses, then you have got an ongoing incentive to keep the elephant stock robust so that you can make money on the, on the, on the hunting rifle licenses. And mm-hmm. what happened is the population of elephants has gone up dramatically since they were privatized. So because if it's privatized, there's a value to somebody, and that person is going to protect that value, whereas poachers, uh, it's easier for poachers to attack elephants on public property where nobody's really defending it because nobody cares that much than on private property where there's an economic incentive. So most of these kind of problems are solved through private property. The same is true of like the burning of the Amazon and create, you know, the problem is nobody owns the Amazon. Somebody should own it. If if I owned Amazon, you couldn't burn my, my forest. It would be my forest. I think there's a a slightly more complicated uh, point with the, say the DuPont example. And it is one that I wrestle over because there are certain regulations with the, how much, the certain concentration of things they can release and without that existing there's no benchmark to work from and we would we know self-regulation with greedy corporates isn't always a good thing at least with some kind of centralized regulation that came from a state at least it's independent of the potential polluter do do you see what i'm wrestling with there sure so i think the i think what you need to do in circumstances like that is there needs to be it needs to, before you have such a law that restricts people's actions, you need a significant burden of proof that somebody's rights are being violated. So, so let's, let's take something that is not easy to privatize the air, right? Yeah. Let's say you have a factory and you're spewing out, I don't know, cyanide into the air. And nobody knows that cyanide is bad, right? Some people get sick. They investigate. Turns out cyanide. Um, and, uh, they now sue the 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 industry that's polluting with the sign. At some point, when these cases uh, become evident, and 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 a few of them, let's say, pass the legislature as they do with common law, I think at that point it makes sense for the government to say, okay, we've got now significant evidence that X concentration of cyanide in people's lungs causes real harm. This has gone through the process, right? And now we're going to ban cyanide above this concentration from being in the air. So there has to be a process in which it's made clear that there's a rights violating. We've learned it, right? Because you can't go back and say, you should have known back then. Mm -hmm. How would I have known back then? But we've learned that this is damaging. And now we stop the behavior given that it's damaging. Is is there any chance for something like that? There's a risk that these things would take too long to possibly even resolve and cause a lot more damage. So for the, I, I, sorry to keep going back to the DuPont, DuPont sure. example. It's just I watched it recently 
And I, I, I know the um, I know Nathaniel Rich from Vanity Fair who did the research piece, but it took nearly twenty years to resolve the case. In that Dupont were able to abuse the legal system. Do you think the legal system would be different? It, it, the, these kind of cases could be expedited in in a different framework. Well, first I'd say that the Dupont case never would have happened if you truly had property rights. Okay. Right. They, the DuPont only happened because they assumed that the water they were spewing their stuff into was not owned by anybody and they wouldn't get caught and, and nobody cared, right? That's point number one. Uh, so I, I think a lot of this just wouldn't happen in, in a proper, in a proper system. I also think things would be a lot more expedited because the legal system would be a lot less burdened because there'd be a lot less regulations and a lot less controls. But also, look, stuff takes time. Mm. I mean, we, we like to have a, uh, a Garden of Eden ideal where life is just perfect and life is, but that's not life. Life is messy. Yeah. Sometimes take time. I, but, and I'll give you an example where sometimes you just got to suffer through the pollution. Uh, the best example of that I can think of is London in the middle of the 19th century. So take London in the middle of the 19th century. Mm -hmm. Literally the air is filled with um, coal dust. I mean, this is really harmful, objectively harmful to human life. This is not good. It's polluting. It's damaging. And yet, if at that point, let's just randomly pick 1850 or 1860, you choose to stop producing energy using coal because people are getting sick, that's the end of civilization. I mean, literally, right? The end of progress, the end of innovation, the end of technology, the end of wealth, the end of all that. Sometimes there is a cost to progressing, to, you know, to growing, to getting somewhere. And if it's civilizational like that, where it's a civilization event, then you just have to say, okay, you know, there's, there's going to be a certain cost, but you know what? Life is still better than it would be if we hadn't discovered coal and we're just going to live to it. It's, it's not as good as our so-called ideal, which we can't really create right now because it's too expensive, but it's far better than what it was without it. We'll, we'll bear the cost. So, okay. I mean, you have to be careful of utopias, right? Yeah. Life is messy. Things are messy. Sometimes things don't work out, you know, optimized based on some ideal that somebody has in terms of how the world will be. But the outcome is far superior by any other measure. So that, any measure. that would put me to guess that you are against any of the current environmentalism which is going on right now and the fear over uh, melting ice caps, et cetera. Is that because yeah. you don't think it's happening or is that because you believe uh, any form of regulation or taxation to try and solve a potential problem would be more damaging? It's not really worth it. So I certainly think the last one is true. I think okay. that the regulations would, I mean, the I, look, if it's really as bad as they claim it is, then we would literally have to shut down CO2 production tomorrow mm -hmm. to, to, to save us all. That would mean like five, six billion people would die. That would mean, you know, just, just the annihilation of the human race, at least at, at the levels in which we live in today. There's just no way to maintain it. Uh, and, and I, I find that particularly absurd and particularly evil, if you will, given that there are solutions if they really cared about the solutions. Whether a solution would be nuclear power, which they take off the table, even though it's the only solution, right? It's the mm -hmm. only thing that does not emit carbon and can produce pretty much an infinite amount of energy. Right? Uh, whether it's uh, all kinds of technologies that might be able to cool the planet as it warms. Nobody wants to touch that kind of stuff, right? So that you put stuff in the atmosphere and it cools. If this is really the end of humanity because of climate change, well, let's try to change the climate in our favor. Uh, whether it's all kinds of technologies that suck CO2 out of the atmosphere that nobody's discussing. Uh, you know, there's a lot of scientists working on this and there's a lot of progress being made of, of doing this. Nobody wants to discuss those. So to me, I'm suspicious when, when the obvious pro-civilization solutions are shunned and what they really want to do is shut down civilization. I'm also suspicious for another reason. I'm a finance guy, right? So if mm -hmm. you want to sell me, uh, if you want me to invest in your project, one of the first things I ask you is, how have you done in the past? Are you good at this? 
If I ask the global warming crowd, how good are you at predicting catastrophes? How, how, how good have you been over the last 50, 60 years? Well, their track record is abysmal, right? It's abysmal. Whether it's we're going to die of cancer really, really young because of chemicals or whether it's because, you know, uh, global cooling or population bomb or, 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 or even with regard to climate change, you know, we're going to, the things they predicted 20 years ago never happened. The things they predicted 10 years ago never happened and so on. So I'm, I'm suspicious. Now, is it happening? Probably. Is it catastrophic, the end of the world stuff? No. I just don't believe that. Um, oh, oh, another thing. If, 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 if uh, oceans are rising, why aren't we building dikes? Right? Think about Amsterdam. It's been under sea level. It's been below sea level for hundreds of years. They build a dike and they protect it. So if there are low-lying areas that we really, honestly, think are going to be submerged, why aren't we thinking about new modern 21st century dike systems to protect the low-lying areas. Uh, so, again, none of these solutions are being considered in any kind of serious way. So I'm skeptical about the urgency or the, the panic involved. Plus, you know, human beings like catastrophes. We like to believe that our generation is going to be the one where Armageddon happens. Uh, you know, millennial cults happen on a regular basis. If you look at the religious fervor, which was some of these people relate to climate change, it seems to me like a religious fervor. I, I don't think that um, point is entirely true in terms of um, if the sea levels are rising, we would be doing things. I just did the search again. I'd have to spend a bit of time on it. But uh, I'm pretty aware that, for example, uh, coastal regions of Florida uh, and Miami have experienced increased flooding, and they are doing work there. And I'm also pretty aware that, uh, say, in the Maldives, they are spending money because then literally the the whole nation will be submerged if, if it's true. So I think some of that is happening. Sure, but nobody's talking about large scale civil engineering projects like we did maybe a hundred years ago to solve a problem, right? Maybe there are localized efforts to pour a little bit more sand on the beaches. I, I'm not sure what they're doing exactly in the Maldives. They're localized efforts to do that. But if this is really you know, again, we're talking about a catastrophe that could wipe out millions of people. You'd think we would be thinking about big solutions and advocating for those instead of saying, and by the way, we'll need a lot of fossil fuels. We'll need to burn a lot of fossil fuels in order to implement these solutions, right? Mm -hmm. And that's why maybe people are not thinking about the solutions in order to do it. I, I, I would say, I think some people are thinking about it. My, I've always assumed the reason it's not really happening is I think – because of the way election cycles work, it's always possible to kick that can down the road a little bit. It's somebody else's problem because sure. who nobody wants to be the president who turns around and says, you know what, we've really got to do something here. We've really got to, you know, we've got to cut back. We've got, so I, I understand your thinking. The question is, are the activists advocating for this? And I don't see that. I see the activists almost exclusively focused on reducing CO2 emissions, which is the wrong goal, mm -hmm. the wrong approach. CO2 is a lifesaver. All companies are the greatest beneficiaries mankind has ever had. We would still be dirt poor without oil companies and, and CO2 emissions. They, I mean, energy is what we live on. And, 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 and the cheapness of energy today is unbelievable and has raised our standard of living. So if we're going to find solutions, they can't be solutions to reduce the amount of energy we produce. And indeed, if you look at this stat, this is a really fascinating stat, mm -hmm. that, um, and that is how many people die from weather events today versus 20 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, like tornadoes and hurricanes and flooding and all these bad things. As well. well, the number has shrunk dramatically. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot fewer people die today because of the weather than at any point in human history. Well, isn't that the measure? And if that's the measure, shouldn't be focused on protecting human life from whatever the weather. I mean, one of the things that really scares me is the next ice age, I, because there's going to be a next ice age. We know that the cycles. Uh, are we ready for an ice age? You know, where there's a glacier in New York City. Uh, you know, it's it's it, it strikes me as there's no relationship between 
the scaremongering and the kind of solutions that they're proposing. And that leads me to suspicion about motivation. No, and, and I can agree with that. The, the suspicion about the motivation is, is certainly an issue. Are there any, uh, within this kind of your school of thought and your thinking, are there any specific areas where you get really challenged, where you think actually maybe that does require some form of regulation? So for example, um, I wouldn't want myself to be able to set up a, a nuclear power plant. And I certainly think nuclear power is something I'm glad is regulated and having watched Chernobyl, which was fantastic, I certainly think there are certain standards that it is useful that we have globally. You know, we had Fukushima as well, which is obviously very scary. And I don't think perhaps we should be building uh, nuclear power plants where there can be tidal waves. I, I, that one I would find hard to argue against. But but again, I'd put it to you. Are there any areas that or other areas where your thinking is challenged? Do you think perhaps we do need regulation? So let me take the nuclear one first. I view it the exact other way around, right? When I watched Chernobyl, okay. I said to myself, oh my God, you know, the last people in the world who should be running a nuclear power plant, designing one, building one, and then responsible for its safety are government officials, government bureaucrats. Those are the last people. And, and I think Chernobyl illustrates why we don't want to take responsibility. It's political. It's not, mm -hmm. it's not economics to drive it. Economics, I understand. Motivations, they, understandable and you can you can easily structure incentives in a way that increase safety and and even fukuyama uh fukushima one of the problems with that old uh, power plant was that because of the regulations because of the panic of the last few decades we haven't built modern nuclear power plants which are far safer than those old ones and as a consequence we rely on old nuclear power plants that are susceptible to things like earthquakes and and uh and tidal waves so my view is if we had allowed nuclear power to continue to evolve, uh, I'm not, and we'll get to how much regulation, but, but let's say free of regulation, I think we would have today small, efficient, unbelievably safe with zero waste because com completely recyclable nuclear power plants and they would be plentiful and they would be everywhere and they would be, and, and, and there wouldn't be any of this risk we'd have, have uh, shut down all the old power plants, and we would have less concern about CO2 because so much of our energy would be produced by nuclear. Um, now, look, if, if somebody's building a nuclear plant in my neighborhood, and so I could imagine that when you're building something where, um, and again, this is why I like small rather than big nuclear power plants. Well, let's say they were building a big nuclear power plant, and there was the potential of a, a, a problem that could wipe out tens of thousands of people or more, then yes, I think that at the margin you could have um, specific, uh, very, very limited regulations that gave the government very, very narrow powers to go in and just make sure that nothing crazy was going on. But I also know that, i give you some examples, you know, you can't build a power plant, you can't raise enough money to build a power plant without issuing bonds without without mm -hmm. taking on debt. Bondholders would want the insurance plan to be insured. They, they want their nuclear plan to be insured. The insurance company now has a incredible incentive to make sure the nuclear power plant is safe. Again, I trust the insurance company more than I trust the government bureaucrat any day to make sure. Why? Because the government bureaucrat, nothing's going to happen to him. Like in Chernobyl, nothing's going to happen to him if he turns out to be wrong. I mean, maybe... Maybe he gets fired. Maybe in the worst case scenario, he gets sent to the gulag. But nothing in a free country is going to happen to this bureaucrat. He's got a lifetime job. An insurance company will lose and go bankrupt. So they better get it right, and that employee will be fired if they get it wrong. I far prefer that incentive than the government bureaucrat's incentive. So you can easily see how in a free market, the incentives for self-regulation, this would be true of building codes and true of all of these things, the government should only interfere if there is what I'll call probable cause. If somebody has noticed something suspicious, something weird, like the crane on this building is really tilting, right? Or, or I watched them pour the concrete and it just looked bad, then there should be a number I can call. And, and yes, maybe then a government inspector comes and said, people in the neighborhood are afraid of what's going on here. We've come to inspect. Other than that, I think markets are a million times better at self-regulating 
and self-regulating here, I'm not, I'm, I don't mean the company regulating itself. I mean, other companies like insurance companies, mm -hmm. bondholders and other elements within the, the, the marketplace regulating the company. I think that I trust that much, much more than I trust any government bureaucrat. It's, it's funny. Um, I, I, I've listened to a number of these shows where they, you know, when they have, where they, they interview farmers in the United States about food safety, the whole issue of food safety. And the farmers uh, always describe uh, how the FDA is, you know, comes and inspects. But when they really get serious, when they really get intense, is when they describe the private companies that are sent to inspect the food on top of the FDA. They're sent by supermarkets, grocery stores. Because, look, the grocery store doesn't trust the government. The government can say the food is fine. The grocery store wants to test it again. Why? Because the grocery store is going to be liable if something bad happens. McDonald's is going to be liable if you eat a hamburger and get sick from it. FDA, food, the food, uh, you know, the food inspector, regulator, they don't care. I mean, they're easily bribed and they're easily, you know, just, just lazy and, and have no reason to do it. Not because they're bad people, but because the incentives are all messed up. The incentives just don't. So private sector just does a better job. And, and, uh, that's because self interest is the right motivation for proper rational decision making. So. Another area I wanted to ask you about, and I'm, I'm pretty sure I know where you'll stand on this, is the social safety net. Now, I'm going to assume you're, you're not particularly keen on redistribution of income because I certainly not myself um, in terms of how the government does it certainly right now. Um, and I've got a specific question related to the pandemic, but I'm going to come back to that. But I watched a film recently on Netflix called crip camp i think it was called and it was about disabled people i don't know if you've seen it it's fantastic yeah. um and then the campaigns that the people who attended the camp ran for years to try and get equal access to buildings and and certain things like that and now i i certainly think in a city like london you could argue that well you don't need wheelchair access to every cinema because you will in a free market there would be enough uh, incentive to build a cinema for disabled people to have access to. But in a small town where I live, the incentive model might be there. And sure. I think it's a great thing that we do have equal access to all people within with, with uh, disabilities to be able to access services. I think that is a great thing that society... I, I see that as a progression of society, and, I, I, and I'm in favour of that. But to do that requires some form of regulation to make it happen, of course. How does that sit with you? I mean, we could. So, I would be against any kind of compulsion okay. to do it. I mean, I agree with you. I, I want to live in a town where people have access. I, I think it's a good thing. I think it's a it's a nice thing. It's the right thing. If enough of us think that's true, then enough of us could get together and and lobby and and encourage store owners, cinema owners, to make the changes necessary to make that happen. So I think it needs to be done voluntarily. I think if, if we're convinced that this cinema owner is being irrational here or, or, you know, is, is, uh, you know, is destroying the town or destroying the sense of what it means to be in the town or whatever, then we can argue against it. Maybe even boycott the cinema. You know, the, the people who want it could boycott the cinema. It doesn't have to be just people in wheelchairs that boycott the cinema. We could all do it. And until he fixes it. So I would much rather see, I think all these kind of issues mm. are dealt with much more positively and much more in a much more healthy way than compulsion. For, so for example, there might be a, a small grocery store in your village that just doesn't have the money to do it. And if you force them to do it, they'll go out of business. And, and some businesses in the US, I know, went out of business when they were forced to do this. Well, maybe that grocery store doesn't do it and there's no access there, but there are other grocery stores that do because they have a little bit more of a, of a, of a profit margin or they have a little bit more capital and they can afford to do it. So you, if you make it voluntary, then it adjusts. And over time, maybe this, this grocer can save enough money to make the changes if, if, it, if that's necessary, right? Yeah, I'm so, not sure. I see. I buy, I buy most of your free market stuff and I'm agreeing with you and I'm nodding, but this one, I think this one feels a little bit more utopian that we hope we would, but 
but I don't imagine we will, especially having watched the film and watching how these people had to comp- yeah. campaign for years and fight for their rights to have equal access. I think they had to do it because people didn't care. And whilst in in your world, as you said, well, we might. I just I don't think that we would. I mean, if if we wouldn't, then we wouldn't. Yeah. Then we don't do it. Then we just don't do it, right? Yeah. I mean, it, you get what you're willing to do. And if you're not willing to, to if you if you if you don't care enough, right? You said mm. you cared. You watched the video. Yeah, fine. But if you don't care enough to actually do something, not do something by voting to take somebody else's money and to force somebody else to do it. Yeah. But if you're not willing to put up your own money to actually go and do and make the changes, then you don't care that much. And if we don't care that much, then it shouldn't happen. That's the beauty of a market. The market values our caring. And our caring is measured by how much, whether we're willing to boycott a cinema, whether we're willing to put our own cash at play. And the same thing with a social safety net. I don't have a problem with the safety net as long as it's voluntary. Mm-hmm. And if you say people wouldn't give enough money to help the poor, then the poor won't get help. But that means we don't care enough about the poor to help them. And that means why is it okay for us to vote to take somebody else's money when we don't care enough to put our own money into it? See, I think we do because the funny thing is like a very, you know, times are really tough right now, especially in the UK. We went through an austerity period of austerity and we we saw a massive growth in the food banks and the food banks often rely on donations and people do volunteer. And if I had the other 40% of my income back that the government takes from me, um, I'm already quite generous with it. I, I'm I'm pretty sure I, w- I would be generous, and I trust myself to distribute it better than the government. So I, I, I'm with you on that side of things. Okay. So I, I'm agreeing with a lot of this. And the next thing I would worry about is that, okay, how do we get there is, is, is a tough question. But how do we maintain it is a bigger question for me. Because one of the things about, say, going back to the idea of the big red button, is that I just think humans – are designed in a way where we like to organize. We have leaders and followers. And without any form of governance and governance structure, we will naturally have bloodshed and and potential warlords. And I know I know the the Rothbardians will say we don't, but we potentially will. Um but it feels like it requires some form of very strong cost constitution to avoid the slow creep of the state to say, oh, we need to do a little bit because we've seen this, the US has a very strong constitution, something I wish the UK had, and I think it's something that's going to protect the, U- the US government from Donald Trump, personally, and I know that's going to trigger people, but I do. Um, I feel like you'd need an even stronger co- constitution to, to, to maintain this small state. So yes, but you need something much more than that. Okay. So I agree about a constitution, and I've got some ideas on how you would structure a constitution to make it much stronger. We can talk about that in a second. But I want to I want to go a little deeper philosophically because okay. I'm ready. I think the problem is not that we don't have the right constitution. I don't think the problem is that people don't understand economics. I don't think the problem is any or any of that. They don't really get how we get wheelchairs into cinemas. I don't think mm-hmm. that's what causes big government. I think the challenge we have is a philosophical one. It's a, it's an ethical moral one. And, uh, and, and this is why it's so hard to convince people of this, of, of, of free markets and the benefit you get in free markets. We grow up believing that our moral duty, our ethical duty and responsibility is to do what? It's to take care of others. A whole morality is built around sacrifice, otherism, altruism, which means otherism literally. It's about thinking of others first. We celebrate people when we view them as selfless. Right? Now, none of us wants to be selfless, and none of us actually is consistently selfless. We would die if we were. But that is our moral ideal. That's a little conscious voice in our mind saying, you need to do good is, is really means you need to sacrifice for the sake of other people. Now, what better way to sacrifice for the sake of other people than socialism, feudalism, you know, all kinds of isms that have a big state. We outsource the responsibility. We don't have to worry about it on a day-to-day basis. And yeah, they take 50% of my income, but I don't care because I'm supposed to do it. It's the right thing to do. It's just, it's noble. And, and I might say it doesn't work, guys. And you go, I don't care that it doesn't work that well. 
I've done my duty. I've done, I've given it to church, right? I gave it mm-hmm. to church. Leave me alone. I'll give again on next Sunday. Right? That whole moral framework needs to be challenged, which means, and I don't know where you stand on this, so I, I risk offending you. No, no, just go with it. Yeah. Um, it means challenging the whole foundation of Christianity, which means challenging the whole foundation of the Judeo-Christian so-called Western tradition, if you will. Okay. And maybe going back to a Greek Aristotelian tradition, which says, actually, that's not what morality is about. It's not about sacrifice. It's not about Jesus on a cross suffering, not for sins he committed. That I get. If you commit sins, you should suffer. No, he suffered because of sins we all committed. That's like the biggest injustice in the world. That's horrible. I don't admire Jesus for giving his life for my sins. I should give my life for my sins. So we have to reject that whole view of morality and embrace uh, Aristotle's view, which is Ayn Rand's, Ayn Rand has modernized and I think improved it significantly. And that is the view that the purpose of life is not to sacrifice and live for others and feel guilty about not doing enough. The purpose of life is to live with a capital L. It's to live the best damn life you can live on this planet. Now, not in some afterlife. It's to embrace happiness. It's to, it's to, it's to strive towards happiness. It's to uh, pursue happiness and be guided by some pretty clear moral principles that are empirically have been shown to produce happiness. That is, and that's what life should be. It's about living the best life you can live in this earth based on using your mind, based on using reason or using, uh, using rationality. And then the question becomes, if that were the moral basis that people accepted, let's say they accepted that, then I would ask them, okay, what is the enemy of you being able to live the best life you can using, you know, using reason and rationality? And what's the enemy of reason and rationality? Well, the enemy of reason and rationality is coercion. If I put a gun to your back of your head, you can't think. If thinking is meaningless, it doesn't mean anything. And of course, you can't act based on your thoughts because you have to act based on what the regulators told you is okay to act on, right? The whole areas of research that people don't even research that entrepreneurs don't go into because they're banned. They're not allowed to. So why even bother? So the only solution for a person who values his own life, values his own happiness, wants to live the best life that he can live, is freedom. It's the freedom to think and the freedom to act based on those thoughts. And as long as you're not violating somebody else's rights, as long as you're not hurting somebody else, being left alone. That's it. So to me, that is what we need to convince people. The economics is easy, right? What's hard is to convince people to live that full, flourishing, successful, embracing life with everything that they have. And then adopting the political system consistent with such a life. That's the challenge. It's the overturning 2,000 years of guilt. Do you, you have know, to, guilt. do you have to enter the political system to do that? I don't mean you personally, but does somebody have to enter the political system with a party, with a goal of doing this? Like we have libertarian parties. Like is, yeah. is, is that possible or not? It's not possible. It's futile. And I think for most part, a waste of money and time. Um, one day it will be possible. One day it will be necessary. But we're far from that day. Uh, what is necessary today is education, education, education. And primarily philosophical and moral education, not political and economic education. Now, you can often use economics and politics to illustrate a moral point. But unless people value their own life in and of itself, and are willing to embrace, you know, if you're a couch potato and you just, you just, you don't care. You're just living, you know, for the moment, you, you television, you're eating the junk food and you, you don't care about yourself and you don't care about your health and you don't care about what's in your head. And you just, then forget it. A- any politician is going to be able to manipulate you and promise you goodies and you'll vote for them. What we need are active minded people engaged in the world, pursuing their happiness, pursuing values, trying to live a good life. If you had those kind of people, then I think freedom becomes almost inevitable, right? We we could easily, I think, convince that group of people that these ideas make sense. It's getting from here to there, which is hard, going to take a lot of time 
and requires real education. It requires people to really think. And, and thinking, thinking is work. So it's funny. The, the other thing I, you know I want to talk to you is about, about the money. Broadly, okay. broadly the money. Yes. Rather than just... The, okay. There's one of the issues we were going to talk about. Yeah, the Constitution. Yeah, Let me Constitution. Just yeah. I would say there are a few things that a Constitution would have to, would have, to have in order to be solid. I would call them four separations. You know, in the Constitution, the American Constitution, there's a separation between church and state. Uh, and I think that's incredibly healthy and, and required. I would actually make it stronger. I would make the, the separation between ideas and state. The state should not have ideas about how people should live, about what's moral and what's not. It should basically be there to protect rights, to protect rights as Locke conceived of them, or as Ayn Rand has modernized it. You know, just protect us from force and not have detailed ideas about human behavior, religious or not religious, secular or religious. So mm -hmm. one, separation of ideas from state. Two, separation from economics from state. Mm -hmm. the, the, the government should have no role in economics, none whatsoever. It, it should never be, it should never raise, right? Uh, it should never be tempted. It, it should have no. And then third would be separation of, of education from state, which I think is crucial. I agree with that. And be separation of state from science, which I think is also crucial, particularly in an era of like panics around global warming and stuff, which I think the politics of it are far more, the politics of the science uh, are, are destructive. So if we could get the government to just focus on what the government is supposed to do by separating from other human activities, then I think we have a better shot at that constitution sustaining itself. But to have to get to that point and then to sustain it, you also need a population that actually has the right morality, the right moral approach to life. Okay. Well, that, they're good points, and that takes me back onto the money point because you said the separation yeah. of economics and state, yeah. so which, no again, fair. I absolutely fundamentally agree with. But how do you do that when the state controls the money? How do you have money that isn't controlled by the state? Well, we've had it. Uh, at least, uh, you know, in, in, in the U.K., you had a great example of this in the, uh, I think it was the early to mid 19th century in Scotland, not in Britain, but in Scotland, uh, until the Bank of England decided that this wonderful free market experiment uh, was diminishing their power and, and basically took it over. So the Scottish free banking system was an amazing period in which Scottish banks actually issued their own currency. Um, and it was a currency that was a, I, I don't know the names of the bank, but Bank X had its currency and Bank Y had its currency. Um, and they would backed, in this case, by gold, gold reserves that they had in their vaults. And it, it's one of the most successful systems in all of history. It's actually more successful than the American system, than the American ever had it. But in America, until 1914, when we established the Federal Reserve, um, banks issued their own currency based on reserves of gold or silver. Canada had the same system, and they only established a, a central bank in, the, I think, the 1940s, so relatively late in the game. And indeed, before central banks, money was gold, and you got you you. But people transacted with paper, paper issued by the people who stored the gold for you, the goldsmiths, and that's how we ultimately developed banking. We developed it organically through a market system. So my argument would be that's where you'd go back to. You'd go back to private enterprise issuing gold. Now, it seems to me logical that banks would do it, uh, would issue money. It seems to me logical that banks would do it because that's what they do. They, they, they deal with money. That's their, that's their area of expertise. I think at the end of the day, it would be backed by something like gold. Exactly what that would be, I would let the market determine. The market has determined in its past that it is gold. Um, and let, let, let's have competition. Now, I know you, for example, probably will argue for Bitcoin. Uh, of if, course. If it's Bitcoin in a, in, a, in a free market, the beauty of it is, great. Let's have b some banks or, or Bitcoin just, just mine Bitcoin and Bitcoin enters the system through whatever channels, through the miners. And, um, and, and let's compete. Now, I think Bitcoin would be crushed in a free market. I think the only reason Bitcoin has value today is because we don't have a free market. I don't think it can survive in a free market. But, you know, maybe I'm wrong. 
And the mm. beauty of a free market is that we get to see who's right and who's wrong based on what matters, which is the user's experience and the user's willingness to embrace this currency or that currency. That's really interesting because I feel like it's a, it's a funny one. I feel like when you've described the kind of perfect money we need, I feel as a Bitcoiner, you've described Bitcoin. And I'm thinking, I, I, I part of me wonders, how, I, so I've seen you talk about it. I obviously had to do some research. And I wonder how much time you spent looking at it and what it is about Bitcoin that has turned you off it. Because to me, it has all the properties of gold, essentially uh, uh, uh if you if you get out if, if you if you ignore the fact that somebody needs to hold onto something tangible if you just talk about the fundamental pro properties it has all the properties of gold but it has these other properties where you can teleport it around the world it's very easy to divide it's highly divisible but most importantly because it's decentralized it isn't really controlled by anyone so can't be it's very difficult to co-opt it so i i'm all i'm there thinking i wonder what it is that, that's made you reject it? Well, that it's intangible. That is, that it, it is that, yeah. Have, that it doesn't have an alternative use. It's either money or nothing. So that if, um, if I had Bitcoin mm -hmm. and nobody was willing to accept it, its value goes to zero, literally goes to zero, because it has no alternative use. I think money has to have an alternative use. Gold has value partially because it's money. But also because it can serve as money. It isn't money right now. But partially because we use it. It's pretty. We use it for jewelry. It's uh, used in electronics. It's used in other things. So even if the if all my neighbors refused to accept gold, uh, it would have still have some value to me. I could still use it. I could still trade it for something because it has value out there. Maybe not as money anymore, but as something else. Right? That to me is the big barrier that Bitcoin. Bitcoin totally relies. And everybody agreeing that it has value. And of course, part of it is that gold, part of the value gold gets in a sense that what is it worth, right? How many cows, how many goats is its value in other uses. What is the value of Bitcoin? I don't know. I, I, I yeah. you know, it's right. It's whatever people want to give it a value of. And this is why. I think the biggest problem in Bitcoin today is it's the volatility, right? The volatility of price. So if I own Bitcoin, uh, yesterday I could buy two cows with it. Today I can buy 73 cows with it. Tomorrow I might only be able to buy half a cow with it. That's not money. That's speculation, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. money has to be stable. It has to have a stable value in terms of what it can buy. And my sense is that, that there's no anchor to allow Bitcoin to ever have that stable value. Now, I have a theory about what gives it a value, right? Which I think you've heard, but, but uh, I'm happy to articulate it. But, but that is something I don't know how to monetize. I don't know how to, how to figure out what that value really is. And therefore, I, I wouldn't own Bitcoin. I'd use it in terms. And by the way, I'm a huge fan of blockchain. I'm a huge fan of cryptocurrency in the sense that, as you said, Easy to move around, privacy, um, uh, divisible, all of that. But what I would like to see and what I think will ultimately be the winner in the crypto game, but not today, in my ideal world, right? When, 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 we, when, we, when, we, when we have achieved the point where we have freedom, is a cryptocurrency backed by gold or backed by something solid yeah. so that so that my bar and gold might sit in a vault in London, but it now is divisible into 75 bits and I can trade those 75 bits and whoever has one of those bits has a claim against my gold bar and the bank would actually give it to them if they, if they put in a, put in the claim to get it. They could actually get that physical gold. That to me combines the two system in a healthy, in a healthy way. Right. But there's a, there's a yeah. few points there. And and I'm, I'm going to counter some of them. So that use of no use of Bitcoin outside of money, I think is a, is a fair point. And I th do think some Bitcoiners do ignore it. But at the same time, um, there are some uses for Bitcoin outside of money. So at the moment, Microsoft have developed something called decentralized IDs, where you can 
create a decentralized ID to use on the internet, which is anchored to the Bitcoin blockchain, which allows you to have an identity to, to use across the net, which is anonymous if mm -hmm. so required, but allows you to build trust around that ID. So that is a, that is a use outside of money. There are others. There are timestamps for timestamping information. Uh, a guy called Peter Todd has created something called open timestamps because it's such a secure network. It is a way of securing information. So I do think there are some uses outside of it. Are they as compelling as industrial use? I don't think so yet. But as we move to become a more and more digitized uh, economy and digitized worlds and digitized life, I, I think there are is a growing importance. But let, there let are me ask you this before we get yeah. before we get to the next point. Um, can I replicate? Is there any limit? to how much I can replicate Bitcoin, not not with the name Bitcoin, but how many different cryptocurrencies I can create with the characteristics of Bitcoin or similar characteristics that can supply the same benefit in terms of alternative use as Bitcoin does. So can Microsoft use Ethereum or 200 other types of cryptocurrencies to achieve the same kind of secure network as they can with Bitcoin? And if so, how do you argue against inflation? Uh, no, not really. No, they can't. I mean, temporarily they can use Ethereum because of Ethereum is a, a, a decent sized network, but Ethereum and, and Bitcoin are very different things. And I've, under, I've, you know, a lot of people make this point about you can copy these uh, um, cryptocurrencies, and, and it, it is a, a point that should be discussed because I think a good analogy would be is that Bitcoin isn't the best blockchain isn't the most efficient on a number of metrics but it's the most trusted it holds the most value and you could go out and create a faster more efficient network but people wouldn't trust it as much and i think a good comparison would be religion i can design a far better religion than christianity with better morals but people aren't going to trust it as much because one of the great things about the religion is the mystery of where it comes from and that's one of the great thing uh, uh, strengths of bitcoin um, so See, the reason that, that makes me suspicious, right? <laughs> what I'm saying is, is that because nobody owns it, nobody knows where it came from, who did it, and it has the it has the network effect because network effects are important. Oh, religions yeah. religions have network effects. Sure. Scientology sure. is for a lot of people is absolute nonsense because we sure. know who invented it and we know why they invented it. Whereas we don't, we can't really tell where most of these religions come from if you sit objectively outside of religion. But Microsoft have chosen Bitcoin primarily because it is the most secure network. The cost to hack the Bitcoin network is tens of billions. I mean, that's better security than, than anything else in, in the world. And like I say, as we move to more virtual worlds, more digitized economies, it is useful. And, and I'm with you on gold. There's a lot of things I prefer about gold, but it's very difficult for me to teleport gold to you in America from here, but I can send you Bitcoin instantly. I'm not either or, by the way, at the moment. I'm both. I think they're both important. I just think over a long enough time frame, there there is a, a number of reasons Bitcoin can win. Not, nece not that it necessarily will, but it can win. Um, and I can't remember the other the other oh the volatility. The only thing I'd say on volatility is yeah, it's totally the volatility is there. But in ten years, we've gone from an asset worth zero to two hundred billion dollar network that may if it reaches gold within the next decade would be 10 trillion is it is i think it's impossible to get from zero to 10 trillion without volatility you you have to you can't go up in a straight line and that requires a lot of speculation but if you track the volatility oh the bitcoin's volatility is decreasing but i understand right and right now the volatility scares some people but other people are willing to take that risk because they believe so much and later on other people might come in when it's less risky sure so i think i think bitcoin's an asset yeah. I just don't think it's money. That's the difference, right? So yeah, I would I would be willing to to hold Bitcoin as an asset and bear the volatility and and you know where it lands up as more companies like Microsoft use it, its value will go up and stabilize over time. I'm just not convinced of its monetary you know, the fact that it is money. Um I think it I think it's it's an there's a whole asset class which is crypto. Mm. blockchain as an asset all these things are assets that have a particular value so i'm not anti-crypto that would be bizarre i'm just anti-blockchain I'm, I'm just <laughs> anti 
the idea that this becomes money and replaces all other forms of money. And even with when it comes to money, I'm, I'm for competition and yep. let's see the best money will win. I happen to think that, you know, this won't happen for another few decades. I know. Um, and when it, when in a few decades, when we have that competition, my guess is that some hybrid gold crypto will win the competition. But, you know, if I'm wrong, who cares, right? I, it's not like anything matters here in yeah. terms of, uh, in, 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 in in terms of my well-being, whether that happens or not, I, you know, I don't, I don't buy Bitcoin for one simple reason. I don't know what its value is. So, if you understand its value and and you have a projection and you can say, I believe it's going to be value X in ten years, then great. Then then go. I can't. I don't know how the math works. I don't know how it how the usage works. Um, it, I don't know if Microsoft using it is justified its current price, justifies the price half of where it is today, justifies the price 10x of where it is today. I just don't know. And I'm a finance guy, so I, I invest in things I, I think I understand. I, th I think, yeah, I, th I, I see the point you're getting. I think what it is is, and I'm not going to hammer the point on you because sure. I, th I think we've done some, had a really good conversation here, but I think the price of Tesla is it's very, very, it's very overpriced right now, but it's overpriced based on the fact that we may all be driving electric cars in 20 years and they will own the cars and they will own the char charging stations and the power packs and it's speculation. And I think the, the price of Bitcoin now is speculation that it will replace gold. I think a lot of that is what it is. So, so I'm much more likely to short Tesla than to buy Tesla right now. Yeah. Cause I'm not sure Tesla can, can win because other competitors come into the market. But it's a massive competition. And yeah. I don't know enough about crypto to say Bitcoin is it. I mean, you sound confident that Bitcoin is it. It's the I'm not. Um, <laughs> I see too many confident people, you know, get blown up in markets and financial markets over many decades, um, and and so I, I'm not willing to take that that risk. Uh, it, you know, so yes, I, I I understand if I if I took Tesla, I could do a present value assessment. I could tell you exactly how many cars and at what profit margin. The stock price today implies Tesla's, the number of cars will sell in 10 years. I can do the math. We can figure that out. And I, I did that once on Amazon uh, years and years ago. This is Amazon was, was, uh, this is 2000. And I came to the conclusion that Amazon was way overvalued. And guess what? I was wrong. It went up. Now, now does that, <laughs> it's still true that it was overvalued at the time. And, but it turned out that Amazon was a winner and a lot of the other companies were losers. If I did that on Tesla today, I would come to the conclusion that it's overvalued. I don't even know how to do that on Bitcoin. I, I don't know how you would go through the math to do that on Bitcoin other than to say, I feel like it should be worth more than this. That's well, all I know how to, how to monetize in a sense. Well, I, I, I mean, I think mine is based on conviction that it's, it's a better form of store value than gold. Can it, can it take gold's position? Ultimately, maybe, I think it can. Maybe it's already fully priced. How do you no. know it, it still has to get a price, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, well, listen, look, I, 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 I could, we could do this for a long time. It's been a great discussion and, and I've got one confession before we finish. Sure. I've never read Atlas Shrugged. Well, you should. I know um, I should. Because I think you'll enjoy it. I think you'll have fun. Put aside the philosophy. Put aside all that. I, I think you'll really enjoy it. But I think given your philosophical leanings and your inclinations, I think I think philosophically you'd get a lot out of it and you'd mm. be inspired by it. Uh, I think uh, – and, and then there's all of Ayn Rand's nonfiction writings, which I think are fantastic. And anybody who believes in markets and is interested about the future – and and how do we get there? Which is a question you asked. Um, I think I think Ayn Rand is is crucial to at least grapple with her ideas in a serious way. Well, I, I know there are a lot of Bitcoiners who, who are big fans of her, and I've had the book recommended to me a couple of times. I can see a, I can see a couple of books in the background there as well. Yeah, that one that one's mine. So. Yeah, I know that's yours. Yeah. Listen. <laughs> I hope we get to do this again at some point. Actually, I think perhaps uh, in a few months when I've read uh, Atlas Shrugged and 
Uh, we should possibly do it again, but um, I've really enjoyed this and I really appreciate your time. I think a lot of people listening to this will enjoy it. Um, if they don't know you, and I'm sure a bunch of people do, but if they don't, do you want to tell people how to find you, how to follow your work? Sure. Well, first, let me say uh, I'm looking forward to doing this one day, maybe in London in person. Yes. Or in the UK in person. I would uh, love that. The days of being, first of all, in London, one of my favorite places on planet Earth, and uh, and, and and just being in person with people. I'm, yeah. I'm tired of these video conferences. I know. Uh, but if people want to find out more about me, uh, Yaron Brook, Y-A-R-O-N Brook, B-R-O-O-K dot com. Uh, you can find me on YouTube. I've got a, I, I produce huge quantities of, uh, of content on YouTube. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Facebook. And of course, if you want to find out more about Ayn Rand, which I encourage everybody to do, pick up one of her books or go to uh, Ayn Rand, A-Y-N-R-A-N-D dot O-R-G, which is the website of the Ayn Rand Institute. Uh, and you can find a ton of material there. So you just Google your own book or Ayn Rand and all of this comes out. It's one of one of the wonders of living in the in the twenty first century. Yes, I will. I would definitely put it in the show notes. And yes, in person would be great. Look, prior to this, I used to do ninety percent of my interviews in person. I used to fly out to the states for three weeks, do twenty thirty interviews, and then come home for a month, and I would do the same again. And and it there is just something that isn't the same. You got to be much more respectful of someone speaking over Zoom, whereas in person you can interrupt easier. Um, I think that's right. I think that's right. Uh, you know, and of course you're welcome to visit Puerto Rico uh, if you if, uh, if love to. Uh, are you allowing people in? Is Puerto Rico open at the moment? It's it's not. You you need to bring a, a test result within seventy two hours and stuff like that. It's mm. it's not it's not easy, but uh, hopefully hopefully I don't know when it'll end, but hopefully it'll end sometime soon. Well, yeah, one time soon. <laughs> All right. Well, listen, Yaron, this was this was great. I really enjoyed this. Um, and like I say, I wish you the best. And yeah, I hope we can do this again sometime. Absolutely. We'd love to.